Okay, well, I clearly can't re really review 40 years of work in 20 minutes, but um, I have to select some topics. And what I decided to do here was to just select topics that uh, sort of spring out of that little clip. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit what we had right in 1974, uh, and then a couple of areas where we got it wrong in 1974, but now we think he, we have it right, and then at, at the end, a little bit on what we still haven't got right. Um, but in uh, the area of what we got wrong, uh, there's, w there's one area where the results clearly gave, the, the 1974 results clearly gave the wrong impression. Uh, I'll talk about that. And then I'll talk about two latent defects, which by which I mean, uh, when we improved the model, the 1974 model, a little bit in the years right after that, so that we could make more predictions and make more comparison with observations, uh, that pointed out deep difficulties where we didn't, didn't agree at all with observations. No, that's what I'll talk about. Okay, um, first, let me uh, just review the logic of <coughs> the Rice convection model. Uh, which actually hasn't changed since 1974. Uh, I mean, the, all, what's in the boxes has changed, but the basic logic hasn't changed. Um, if you start with a plasma distribution in the magnetosphere, what we do first is calculate gradient curvature drift currents. Um, the, in the Jupiter-Saturn version, which Tom Hill is going to talk about in a couple of days, uh, there's also centrifugal drift and Coriolis and pickup currents, but for the Earth, you don't need those. Anyway, so... For the Earth, we calculate the gradient curvature drift. We take their divergence, calculate the Birkeland current. That current rains down on the ionosphere. Uh, given the ionosphere conductance model and a potential boundary condition, we calculate the potential distribution in the ionosphere. We map it back to the equatorial plane of the ionosphere. Nowadays, we use a time-dependent magnetic field model so that the induction electric field is included in this electric field. And then given the electric field and the magnetic field model, we can calculate the drift velocity of the particles and advance the plasma distribution by a time step. In the modern RCM, this takes uh, a second or two to make a time step, and it just goes around and around that thing. Okay, now the, the question, what we got right, uh, this, this is just a, a screen grab from, from that video rotated 90 degrees to the more modern convention. Uh, the fact that I mentioned in, in the video, there, there are two rings of Birkeland current here. Uh, the more poleward one has downward current on the Don side, up, upward current on the desk side, and the more equatorward one uh, has the opposite sense. <clears throat> now later uh, in 1974, uh, Zmuda and Armstrong came out with what I think was the first observational summary diagram that showed that. So this was one of the rare cases where the theorist predicted something before it was observed. Now, however, the, the idea for this didn't come from the, the Rice convection model. The first clear theoretical prediction, as far as I can see, came from a paper by Shield, Freeman, and Dessler in 1969. And that, that was the, a qualitative paper that got me started on the Rice convection model. So essentially, I've worked, spent the last 45 years working out the details of that. Um, then a couple of years later, Vasilyunas came out with, with an analytic theory that derived the same basic pattern. So what the RCM did was to confine, uh, uh, confirm the same things, uh, but in a time-dependent form and with less idealizations than Vasilyunas had to make to make it analytic. Okay, the shielding, um, here again are two screen grabs. Um, that's something else we got right. That is the tendency of the inner edge of the plasma sheet to shield the inner magnetosphere from the convection electric field. That, that was correct. Um, and we found that the, the changes in the magnetospheric electric field when the, when the IMF turns north or south uh, the changes penetrate the low L and then the shielding adjusts uh, 
uh, and reasserts itself, but in the meantime, there's a penetration. Okay. Now, one thing we, get, we get, got wrong at that time was the strength of the shielding. Um, in, in the pictures I showed there, the shielding was, was you know, 90-some percent efficient. That, that's not typical. And uh, the, the biggest problem there, that the, I mean, the, the modern RCM uh, gets a, a much more variable efficiency. Uh, the main problem actually there was kind of a dumb thing, but, but we didn't have, in, in the 1970s, we didn't have an empirical model of the plasma sheet. So we didn't know, we, we didn't know what to put in for the plasma sheet temperature and a boundary condition. Now, when the empirical models came along in the late 80s, uh, it became clear that we'd considerably underestimated the plasma sheet temperature, and changing that reduced the shielding efficiency quite a bit. An introduction of the self-consistent magnetic field, which was much later, also tends to reduce the shielding efficiency. Now, this, this question, we've worked more on the prompt, what's now called the prompt penetration electric field. Um, the, the main problem in this area of getting that right is that the actual low latitude ionospheric electric field sort of has three sources, the neutral wind that's due to the, the heating of the day side, there's this direct penetration of magnetospheric electric fields, and then this disturbance dynamo, which is due to the, uh, the activity, the magnetospherically driven activity in the uh, high latitude ionosphere making its way to low latitudes. And it's hard to disentangle the two. Uh, nowadays, uh, the, at least one of the more sophisticated ways of calculating this is by coupling the Rice convection model to the CTIP E, Tim Fuller Rowles, essentially, thermosphere ionosphere model. And here's an example of that where we calculate the total vertical drift at the equator at Hickamarca versus time. Um, and these rather elaborate simulations get the low latitude electric field uh, kind of more or less right, as you can see here, uh, except when they don't. It's a little hard to disentangle because you don't know where the problem is. Okay, now let me talk about the, these latent defects. That is, things we didn't discover were defects until we improved them all a little bit till we could predict more. Um, now, in that 1974 version, the electrons were cold and the ions were assumed to be equatorial mirroring in the plasma sheet. So the, the plasma sheet was this thin sheet with pressure either infinite in, in the equatorial plane or zero outside it. Now you couldn't calculate pressure from that. Um, also, the, the Birkeland currents were all concentrated at the sharp inner edge of the plasma sheet, which was just assumed to be sharp. Okay, th so uh, in the years following 1974, between then and 1980 or so, we improved the model by assuming an isotropic distribution rather than equatorial mirroring, which is a lot closer to the plasma sheet. And then we broke the plasma sheet into electrons and ions and then represent the, each of those chemical species by uh, many uh, 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 invariant energy channels, so we were getting the energy spectrum. Now, one thing we hoped would, this would do would be allow us to correctly predict the thickness of the region two current. Well, it didn't. Um, these are some slides from our first simulation of an actual event with the Rice convection model. It's published in 1981. And these are the east-west magnetic deflection that we would expect um, on a polar orbiting spacecraft. The spacecraft in this case was an old Air Force spacecraft called S-32. This was the uh, magnetic deflection that was seen, and these are the two different uh, Rice convection model runs. The problem is that, that systematically, we tended to get too, uh, the, the too small a latitudinal extent for the Rice convection model, uh, Birkeland currents, and then, and then a region poleward of the region two currents where there's kind of no Birkeland current. Now you do see that sometimes, but that's not typical, whereas there's kind of 
all the time in the rice convection model, and that was true for many, many years. So over the years, we tried many possible fixes for that, and nothing worked until very recently, and I'm going to come back to that. Okay, the second big discrepancy, um, when we actually made an isotropic distribution in the plasma sheet, and so we could calculate plasma sheet pressures and compare them with data, they didn't agree. Okay. Um, and that was a, a major problem. We pointed out in 1980 papers, called the, we called it the pressure balance inconsistency. So this was another case where making an obvious improvement in the model produced a nice clear disagreement with observations, which however turned out to be informative. Uh, the easiest way to see this pressure balance inconsistency problem is to look at this quantity PV to the gamma, PV to the five-thirds, where V is the, <coughs> the volume of a flux tube with one unit of magnetic flux. Now, many people, you, you can't measure the flux tube volume, so you can't calculate that. Uh, you, can't, you can't just observe it. However, statisti using statistical magnetic field models, you can calculate it, and many people have done that. And they all look sort of, sort of like this case, which was done by Dick Kaufman. That is, PV to the gamma uh, sort of monotonically increases out through the plasma sheet. Okay, and, and it's not a small effect. This is a factor of f four, five, okay. Now, the problem with that is that adiabatic drift theory uh, implies that the, the, for any kind of particle, the, the partial pressure times the flux tube volume to the five-thirds is conserved along a drift path. So if the particles are drifting along here, PV to the gamma should be more or less conserved. Okay, so, so it seemed like that strong tailward gradient of PV to the gamma was con inconsistent with the idea of sunward convection in the plasma sheet. So the questions by the early 80s had become, what, what's the explanation for that? What's the physics that the RCM is not capturing? And can it be modified to capture it? So we started to work on that problem. Uh, uh, Dwayne Pontius and I wrote a paper in 1990 that pointed out that a flux tube that has <clears throat> lower PV to the gamma than its neighbors should move earthward toward regions of smaller flux tube volume. And we call those uh, decreased flux tube volume, those things bubbles. And the reverse, if it was overpopulated, high PV to the gamma, we call those blobs. And they should move tailward and the reason for that is shown in this cartoon uh, for a bubble. It's, it's just that the westward cross-tail current through the bubble is smaller than the surrounding medium because the bubble doesn't have that much plasma on it. So that causes the dawn side of the bubble to charge up positive, the dust side negative, uh, which gives you an extra westward electric field which propels the bubble inward. It's, it's, it's just interchange. Uh, now, uh, right about the time we wrote that paper, uh, the phenomenon of bursty bulk flows were discovered in, in the Earth's plasma sheet. And these were times of enhanced flow that included bursts with velocities more than 400 kilometers a second. And in the region the R RCM tries to do, the flows are mostly earthward. Then we suggested that that, of course, made the obvious association that the flows were, those BBFs were bubbles. And gradually, the observational, the observations came to confirm that. I listed two papers, but there are lots. Now, um, there's also been lots of theoretical work and computational work on, on the dynamics of bubbles in the plasma sheet using different codes. But, but we've been up until very recently, we haven't figured out how to include bursty bulk flows in the rice convection model. Uh, but we've recently, we've made a first effort, which is, looks very promising. And Jin Yang has done this. Um, what he's done is, is to do now high resolution runs with the RCME, which is the modern version of the RCM, which he imposes mesoscale irregularities in PV to the five-thirds on the tailward boundary. And that's the representation of BBFs. So we're planting 
bubbles on the back boundary. Now, what he's done, he, he's trying to duplicate an average situation to compare with statistical model. So it's a 50 kilovolt potential drops. He put in these scale size, these irregularities with a few Earth radii scale size. The trick for a long time until we finally figure out a way to do it is how to represent the amplitudes of these things, you know, how much depleted. Okay, but what we decided to key on was the velocity probability distribution, one of which is shown here. That is the probability um, of different velocities being seen in, in the plasma sheet. And this is 10 years of uh, GeoTail data, Chi Ping Wang uh, did the statistics for this. Now, if you just run the RCM with steady inputs corresponding to the average magnetosphere, then the, the uh, fluctuations look like this, not nearly as much as observed. As you really get, you know, it's, it's this wing with hundreds of kilometers a second, which are bursty bulk flows. That's, that's the thing we want to get. And so what, what uh, Jin Yang did was to mess with the boundary condition and put in uh, uh, a spectrum of disturbances at the boundary so that the velocity distribution, and this is actually 10 to 19 or 30 i in the RCME, agreed with this uh, long-term average for the plasma sheet. So we're getting roughly the right amount of activity. But we are assuming a very simple assumption that all the velocity fluctuations are assumed with interchange effects and the, the resulting bubbles and the ret resulting return flows and churning. Okay, now here's a sample clip from this. Uh, the black lines are equipotentials. PV to the gamma is, is the color, okay? And this is a bursty bulk flow. And, and the bursty bulk flows in boundary conditions were sort of danced around here. Uh, at this particular time, it was here. So the, the closely spec equipotentials here means strong flow. There is some outward flow through the boundary here. So these high PV to the gamma uh, regions lie mostly on outgoing flow. And so, and so they, uh, they'll go out most, mostly, but not all. I would say that the, this, this simulation is very consistent with Rod, what Rod Heal has said about the difference between the real ionosphere and the average flow pattern. Uh, what we're trying for is the real magnetosphere and ionosphere because the pattern maps. Okay, so the question is, does that, does that resolve the pressure balance and consistency? Okay. So we've... Uh, what I've plotted here is PV to the gamma versus X, three different curves. The black curve is an empirical curve that's consistent with the uh, boundary conditions we used here. The blue curve is just running the RCM without the BBFs. The red curve is running it with the BBFs. Okay, so we haven't got perfect agreement. We still have a discrepancy here, but nevertheless, the BBFs uh, get rid of a uh, large part, probably most of the pressure balance inconsistency on this first try. Um, the other thing, well, let's skip that slide and go to this one. We also found that these are Birkeland current pattern. The color is Birkeland current patterns. This is the control run um, with no bursty bulk flows. This is the This happens. Okay. Uh, anyway, anyway, the the Birkeland currents are now spread out more in latitude than in the control run. So the diversity bulk flows have done that on the average. However, they also make a very noisy pattern. So a prediction of this explanation of this all is that uh, the we, the, the noise level that we get out of this theoretical calculation hopefully will agree with what's obs the observed noise level in Birkeland currents, and we're going to try to look at that in the data. So the summary, what was right 
in the 74 runs, the region two current, the basic pattern was right. The shielding tendency was right. What was clearly wrong was the shielding, we, we said it was stronger than it really is. We had these two latent problems that came up shortly after 1974 with the pressure balance inconsistency and in the region two current thickness, which we're, we struggled with for many years, but we now think maybe we have a solution to that by including BBFs. Uh, now, many improvements have been made in the RCM that I didn't mention because I just selected these topics. The, the biggest one of which is that we now run usually with uh, magnetic field with self-consistent with the RCM computed pressure. That had big consequences, which I didn't have time to talk about. Of course, we've worked on sub substorms and storms, which I didn't talk about. One area that I'm excited about right now is with these high resolution runs, we're beginning to try to compute discrete auroral forms, at least the location of them, based on the idea that they are sharp jumps in PV to the gamma because of Vasiliunas' equation. As Vasiliunas' equation says, you get an upward current when you get a sharp jump in PV to the gamma. Uh, and we're computing that. So we've done two studies with this. The growth phase, we get a reasonable looking growth phase arc, and we also easily get streamers associated with the bursty ball flows. The biggest remaining deficiencies in the RCM are it doesn't include inertial effects, and that, that's substantial. It doesn't include field line potential drops, and that's substantial, and we're working on them. Final thing, I, I just wanted to compare the two, the 1974 and the two, yeah, I was just gonna run the move, well. My hope was to run the movie and stop. Okay, so that's sort of, what's that? The difference between the 2014 picture and the 1974 picture. We have time, uh, eight or ten minutes for discussion. Um, it's, uh, with the RAS inversion model, you make much use of the use of PV to the gamma being a constant. Um, I always find myself a little confused about that when you have non-dipolar geometries, especially, for example, if you have reconnection happening, you can change the flux tube volume just by cutting field lines. How does that change the entropy of a flux tube? It, well, in the, in the tail geometry, it reduces it. That is, it's explicitly assumed that there is no reconnection in this region. But, but you hit exactly the point, an important point. At this point, we, we introduce bubbles through the back boundary, and, and we just don't, we don't allow any reconnection or any, any violation of that law. Uh, the next thing we want to do is to do a controlled uh, change in PV to the gamma okay. uh, and see what happens. I'm, and I'm, we just figured out how to do that easily, and I'm really looking forward to it. But, but you're absolutely right, and, and I, I, I think some violations of PV to the gamma occur in, the, in this region. Yeah, I think once you've Absolutely. set it, then it's a different question because that advects with the fluid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other related, related to that is I was curious about your remark that PV to the gamma, gradients in PV to the gamma correspond to Vassal Lunas's solution and that's heat flux. Changes in PV to the gamma is ready with heat flux, not with field line current. So I'm a little confused about that remark. Well, Vassal Lunas's equation, I'm not going to find the slide now, but it it can be written, J parallel is grad V cross grad PV to the gamma divided by V to the five thirds. So I just write it a little bit different for my purposes. Um, first, I'd like, just like to say, Dick, for those of us in the modeling community, your rigor and honesty has always been very refreshing and inspirational. <laughs> um, uh, a question about um, reconciling introducing bursty bulk flows, which are fast uh, beasts in the plasma sheet uh, into the slow flow approximation of RCM. Can you comment on that? Well, that's a deep problem. That, that's why I said including inertia in the RCM was such a major problem. Um, we did this study using thin filament calculations a couple years ago, it was published a couple years ago. Uh, 
where it's a very special geometry where we can solve the MHD equations with very high accuracy and we can use the RCM approximation and we compare the two. So we have an idea of what difference that makes. Uh, and the main difference is that the, uh, well, for one thing, you get oscillations if you include the inertia. And the RCM won't oscillate. Uh, the other thing is that these, these potentials are overestimated. As you, the, the thing moves as much as the RCM would say it is, but it takes a while to get going. It gets going, it, o it oscillates. So the net motion is, is the same as here, but not like those potential electric fields are a little high. So, but that is, we're working on a simple way to try to include inertia approximately. I mean, we're struggling with this. There, you know, there is no model of this that's good. Uh, and so we're, we're approaching good from one angle. Improved MHD codes would approach it from the, another angle.